Good morning, and thanks for joining me for Rise and Crime, your morning caffeine hit all about crime. I'm Mama Jules, and let's start with an update to a school shooting from January of this year that happened in Virginia. Now, as a child, Abigail Zwarner said she used to write in her journal that she wanted to be a teacher when she grew up. And she credits that inspiration to be a teacher to her mother, Julie, who was also an educator. And she followed through on that dream to be an educator by attending James Madison University and graduating with a degree in elementary education in 2020. Now, Abigail faced tragedy that same year. Her father, who was a Newport News firefighter and a paramedic serving on the hazmat team, Well, he died unexpectedly at the age of 56 at his home. She pulled through that difficult period and began teaching and loving 21 first graders at Rich Neck Elementary School in the Newport News School District. And as all teachers will tell you, their classrooms are made up of well-adjusted children and also children who have behavior issues or emotional issues. It's just part of what they sign up for but that doesn't mean the issues are easy to manage or control. One such student in Abigail's class was a six-year-old boy that I'm going to call Jay. He's a minor, and we're just not going to use his name here. Well, Jay had a history when he showed up in Abigail's class. Different reports point out some of Jay's past issues. You know, issues like cursing at staff at the school or One time he used his belt to hit and whip other students. Well, in 2021, he allegedly approached his teacher from behind and locked his arms around her neck. Reporting states that after that attack, he was removed from that school and relocated to another school. And his outbursts didn't stop when he was placed in Abigail's class. He reportedly had broken Abigail's cell phone when he slammed it to the ground. And for this behavior he received a one-day suspension. And typically, suspensions, they're designed to improve behavioral issues. But on the first day back from the suspension, terror struck Richneck Elementary School. On that morning, Abigail and other staff members at the school had reported to administrators that Jay's conduct was concerning. They believed he might have a weapon with him. At about 11.15 that morning, Abigail told school officials that Jay had threatened to beat up another student. Then, just after noon that day, a second teacher said they had taken it upon themselves to search Jay's backpack because they were concerned for the safety of Jay and for others in the school. Then a third teacher told administrators shortly before one o'clock that Jay had revealed to another student on the playground that he had a gun. Jay allegedly told that student that if he told the teacher, Jay would shoot him. Now, administrators allegedly told the various reporting staff members to just wait out the situation since the school day was almost complete. While those teachers were waiting out the day, another school employee allegedly asked administration if they could search Jay's backpack. Permission to search the backpack was denied, according to reports. Well, Abigail had texted a friend saying she was concerned about the situation and that she felt like she wasn't getting help from her superiors. Then, shortly before school ended on that January afternoon in 2023, students were finishing up a lesson when Jay pulled out a 9mm Taurus pistol and pointed it at Abigail. And a startled Abigail asked Jay, what are you doing with that? Then, when she tried to reach for the gun, Jay shot Abigail. The single bullet passed through her hand, shattering some bones. Then fragments from the bullet lodged into her chest. A staff member who was helping in the classroom subdued Jay and removed the gun from him while Abigail ushered all the other students out of the classroom to safety. Remember, Abigail's wounded and she's getting the rest of the students to safety. Well, after that, Abigail struggled to find her way to the office to report the shooting. Once she reached the office, she passed out. Police were alerted to the scene, and Jay was taken immediately to juvenile detention. According to a police affidavit, while in custody of the juvenile detention officers, Jay admitted to shooting Abigail. He told officers that he got his mom's gun out of her purse and that he shot that bitch dead. Now, I'm going to pause in the case here and tell you, I did a quick search on the internet about the size of a Taurus 9mm. So I'm envisioning a six-year-old. 
tucking a nine millimeter into his pocket. And to be honest, it's throwing me off a bit. But I did find that a micro version of the Taurus nine millimeter is manufactured and it weighs a little more than a cell phone. And I don't know if his mother owned the micro version of the gun or not. I'm just trying to wrap my head around how a first grader concealed this gun in his jean pocket. But obviously he did, because that's how it happened. It's just me trying to answer all the questions. All right, let's jump back into the timeline. Abigail's mother, Julie, says the day of the shooting was shocking and surreal. She said she broke the speed limit laws to get to her wounded daughter. Once she arrived at the hospital, she didn't know if Abigail was alive or just wounded. And if she was wounded, she had no idea how severely. She waited and waited for any information from hospital personnel or law enforcement. Finally, two detectives appeared and asked for her to follow them to a room where they could give her an update. As she walked behind the two men, she slowly realized that they were headed towards the hospital sanctuary, or the chapel as some might call it. Julie figured the reason they were headed to this room is because the detectives were going to tell her that her daughter had died in the shooting. Well, relief flooded over her when the two men told her she was alive and that she was currently in the x-ray department getting some CAT scans. After telling her that her daughter was alive and that her injuries were treatable, they then told her that Abigail was shot by one of her young students. Julie was shocked by this information. And to be honest, so was the community of Newport News. The elementary school remained closed for the next three weeks. And during that time, the school principal, Brianna Foster Newton, she left her position. Then the school's assistant principal, Dr. Ebony Parker, resigned. And then more fallout continued. School district superintendent, Dr. George Parker III, was voted out of his position by the school board. When the school reopened, additional safety measures were introduced. Two permanent school division security officers were placed at Richneck Elementary, along with two new metal detectors that were always active. And some doors were installed in previously open areas and students also received clear backpacks to use at the school. And at nearly the same time as all of this was happening, the parents of six-year-old Jay released a statement via their attorney. In it, they claimed their son had an acute disability. Then in May, they kind of clarified their statement, saying that Jay had been diagnosed with ADHD. They said he had started medication before the shooting and that he absolutely was meeting the goals the school district had lined out for Jay. Now, those goals included meeting a minimum behavior standard that resulted in his parents not attending class with him. It appears that was happening several weeks before the suspension, a parent showing up at school each day with Jay. But the parents claimed that the school wasn't requiring one of them to attend with Jay anymore, and that's why neither parent was there on the day of the shooting. The parents also said that Abigail's phone was broken by accident by Jay, that it wasn't a form of acting out, and that he didn't intentionally break it. Well, in April of 2023, Deja Taylor, that's Jay's mother, she was indicted by a grand jury and charged with felony child neglect and misdemeanor recklessness. All of that in connection with the shooting by Jay. When law enforcement announced the charges against Deja, Abigail's attorney said that there were failures in accountability at multiple levels that led to Abigail almost being killed. She stated that the charges relating to Deja only address one of the failures. Jay has not to this point been charged with anything related to the shooting, but he is still receiving care for his behavioral issues and for the trauma resulting from the shooting. Now, Deja eventually pled guilty to the charges and she was supposed to be sentenced last week, but that sentencing hearing was delayed until December. And Abigail's recovery has been slow and tedious. She spent two weeks in the hospital having surgery and recovering. She says she now has days where she can't get out of bed due to the mental trauma. And of course, the healing on her hand and chest has been slow, but she says she is progressively getting healthier. Her twin sister had this to say about Abigail's experience. She told the Today Show that her sister is an inspiration that she will always look up to for her fortitude and her strength. And Julie, her mother, said simply, that she has a strong daughter. Abigail said it is hard to come up with words to describe how amazing her family has been through the last few months. All right, 
Here's where the update comes into play. Following the shooting, Abigail sued the Newport News Public Schools for $40 million, alleging gross negligence against school administrators. But the school board said the lawsuit is frivolous, arguing that Abigail's injuries fall under workman's compensation. All right, workman's comp would have paid Abigail almost 10 years worth of a partial salary, and she would have also received lifetime medical benefits for her physical and psychological injuries. But Abigail chose not to go that route, and she filed the lawsuit instead. Well, finally, after several hearings, Judge Matthew Hoffman ruled on Friday that Abigail can proceed with the lawsuit, saying that her case does not solely fall under workman's comp umbrella. The judge stated that getting shot at work does not fall under the reasonable expectations of workplace safety. And in my opinion, the day that we accept that teachers might just get shot at school while working is a sad day for America. We need to do everything we can to shift the culture and allow teachers and other school staff to feel safe while at work. Now, the civil trial is expected to reach a courtroom in January of 2024. That is, unless the Newport News School Board and other defendants appeal the judge's ruling. And I think it's a pretty safe bet that they will. So we'll just have to see. I'll keep you updated if this trial does happen. And now to this case update out of Florida. Back in August, I brought you the story of 59-year-old Timothy Smith, who was the beloved gay activist found dead in an apartment that he and his partner, 55-year-old Herbert Swiley, maintained. Herbert and Timothy had been a couple for 13 years. And let me just remind you a little bit more about Timothy. He was a lively drag queen performer whose stage name was Augusta Wind. He typically was the highlight performance of any drag show because he mixed comedy in with his performance. He was also beloved in the memory care community. He was employed as the executive care director for an assisted living center. And at one point, he worked in the villages in Florida where he directed the villages rehab facility. And if you know anything about the villages, Lots of conservative members of the older generation live there. But Timothy could truly balance his less than conservative lifestyle while still loving and serving his conservative patient clientele. Now, in an interview in 2014 with the Village's newspaper, he was quoted as saying that he would not trade one second of his life for anything, neither the good nor the so-called bad. He said his life was unique to him and that unique path has helped him become the person he was. Tim focused his occupation on person-centered care. His philosophy was to take the golden rule and elevate it to the platinum rule. He said care facilities have come a long way in a cultural change of moving what used to be predominantly a medical model of nursing homes to one that is as close to home away from home as possible. Well, on March 25th of this year, co-workers at the memory care facility were anxiously searching for Timothy. It had been nearly two days since he was answering calls or texts. Investigators served a wellness check at the apartment in Ocala where they found a horrifying scene. They found Timothy with a dark ligature mark around his neck, blunt force trauma to his face, and then also to his genitals. Investigators determined he had most likely been killed the night of the 23rd or the morning of the 24th. Now, an autopsy was performed and toxicology reports showed that Timothy had a massive amount of antihistamine diphenhydramine in his body, 30 times more than the therapeutic dose. Diphenhydramine, well, it's found in allergy meds and usually it makes a person drowsy. So the autopsy also found that whoever killed Timothy strangled him so severely that his neck was broken. Now, when I brought you the story in August, the autopsy results hadn't been released. So that's new. But also, when I brought you the story in August, I was baffled by Timothy's partner. Remember, Herbert? Well, I was baffled by his response to the murder. Herbert wasn't the one to report his partner missing for two days. Co-workers reported Timothy missing. And when Herbert was contacted by investigators, he didn't call the family immediately. Instead, he made a Facebook post telling everyone that his dearest friend and partner had died. And then his next move, he made a GoFundMe page asking for help with funeral expenses. 
And I took issue with this the first time around, and I still have issues with it. This GoFundMe post is so generic. I'll read it to you word for word. Hi, this is Timothy's spouse raising fund for funeral and celebration of life. The money will be used for cost on funeral and celebration of life event. It will also help with expenses for the family. Because of this tragedy, there is unforeseen expenses. This has been a tragic loss for everyone, family and friends. All right, you guys, obviously he's not a poet or an author, but I'm gonna totally forgive that. I'll also forgive the weird sentence structure, but what I can't get past is the lack of information about Timothy. There's nothing about him. GoFundMe pages are typically filled with explanations about the victim or the loss. Here, there's just nothing. Just a plea for money. Not even his husband's full name is included in the post. Well, Herbert's, what some would call, weird behavior continued over the next few months, making several posts about how much he loved his husband, but at the same time, he isn't working with law enforcement at all. And Herbert lawyered up, which he should have done. Totally, he should have gotten a lawyer. You should always get legal protection. But this had a bizarre twist. The lawyer contacted the district attorney and said if immunity would be provided to Herbert, then Herbert would participate in the investigation. Well, investigators didn't bite. Instead, they announced that Herbert was a person of interest. And now with this update, I can tell you on Friday that police arrested Herbert for first degree murder and for tampering with evidence. He is being held in the Marion County Jail without bond. Here's what investigators think happened. They believe that Timothy was suffering domestic abuse at the hands of Herbert. Investigators discovered that Timothy was going to leave the relationship. He was actually trying to secure a new job in a different county in Florida, and he planned to move there without his husband. Then there's the life insurance. Herbert stood to profit from Timothy's death. He was the beneficiary of life insurance policies totaling $333,000. But remember, he needed that GoFundMe account to pay for the funeral. And investigators say, while at Herbert's home, Herbert dosed Timothy with diphenhydramine. He then choked Timothy and broke his neck. Then they believe he drove Timothy's body to the apartment where he staged a fake crime scene with Timothy's body. And he also used household cleaning agents to just destroy evidence. But his night was not complete, according to court documents. They say Herbert then drove back to the shared home and left his car there. He got into Timothy's car and drove that vehicle to the apartment and left that vehicle there. He then walked back to the shared home and destroyed the evidence on the ring camera footage. Investigators believe the last thing Herbert did that night was to roll up two carpets from the home, drive them to a landfill, and deposit them there. Now, investigators were initially skeptical of Herbert's answers to their questions. They said that Despite him acting cooperatively during the initial interview, they felt he was providing false and self-serving statements that were contradicted by the evidence at the scene. One such statement that Herbert made, he claimed to be asleep on the night of the 23rd to the 24th of March, but nearby surveillance footage proved otherwise. You guys, you just can't beat the residential cameras. And in an interview with WESH, Timothy's sister, Sandy, expressed her relief that Herbert was finally arrested. She said she had learned about her brother's murder on social media. She said Herbert had not even bothered to contact her. Then when she finally held a conversation with Herbert, she said his story changed three times about what had occurred over those few days. She also said abusing her brother's body the way investigators say it was abused would have been rather difficult. She said her brother was a tall, strong man and that she is brokenhearted that he went through this abuse. She also said that when she got the call from investigators that Herbert was going to be arrested, that she just started crying and thanking Jesus because there have been so many prayers going up that her brother would receive justice. Well, Sandy is truly the only surviving member of Timothy's family. His obituary listed Herbert's daughter as his surviving daughter, but up till now, that daughter has been protecting her father. So Sandy is his one only advocate with a family tie. His obituary was loaded with occupational accomplishments. 
He truly served the elderly community with his love and dedication. All right, we'll just have to watch and see if Herbert is convicted for the death of Timothy. His next court date is scheduled for December 5th, so I'll keep you updated. And I bring you lots of death and murder here on Rise and Crime, but let's finish today with an arrest that involves someone you might already be familiar with, and it's not an arrest for murder. 39-year-old Stevie Flockhart was intensely involved in the music industry for more than 12 years. He was so engaged in the industry that he auditioned for both American Idol and The Voice. Here, just check out this YouTube recording of him on American Idol. Telling yourself that you have enough Didn't know if I would ever see you Now I look around and I believe it When I fall down I get back I'm telling myself that I can't give up Well in 2012, Stevie changed directions in his life because he claimed God told him to. It was after this revelation from God that he became the pastor of the 901 Church in Millington, Tennessee. Now, on the church website, in the description of the pastor Stevie Flockhart, it says that God had made it clear to Stevie that he was supposed to walk away from what could have been a very prominent music career. And instead, he was supposed to pastor and lead people to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, the description then goes on to say that with the support of his incredible wife, Whitney, they have allowed God to use them to tend over 1,200 people, encouraging those people to give their lives to Jesus. Now, I don't, I don't know how many people on here are religious. I'm religious, and I objectively looked at the values listed on the 901 Church website. And you guys, they're pretty good. They talk about respecting and honoring people. They talk about choosing to contribute instead of consuming. And my favorite one, they never tap out. They fight for each other and not against each other. But according to authorities, Pastor Stevie has struggled with some of those values listed on the website. A week ago, Shelby County law enforcement arrested and charged Stevie with identity theft and theft of merchandise. He was booked into the county jail and released one day later after making a $2,000 bond. So here's what they say went down. Three years ago, Stevie agreed to open a joint credit card with a church member named Dana. The card was strictly supposed to be used for church purposes. Well, in order to open that credit card, Dana had to give Stevie personal information. But recently, Dana, who shared that credit card with Stevie, well, he had a need to check his credit score. He was alarmed to find out that his score had dropped significantly. As Dana dug through the credit report further, he noticed that he had a $6,500 unpaid bill on an open line of credit in his name. But here's the problem. He says he didn't open the line of credit in his name. And he says the only person he could come up with who had his personal information was Pastor Stevie. So when he called Stevie and confronted him about the line of credit, He says Stevie admitted to opening the account and making the charges. And the police affidavit also lines out that when the loan holder for the line of credit was contacted, they verified the phone number on the account was the same number as Stevie's. It should have been, in theory, Dana's number so that the loan holder could contact Dana. But we might have a he said, he said situation here because it appears the 901 church is standing behind Stevie. In a Facebook post on Friday, the church said the following, while we do not find the allegations factual, we believe that vindication is from God and stand firm in his sovereignty and truth. Please pray for our pastor and his family, for the hearts of those who seek to attack him and the church and our community. Well, unfortunately for Stevie, this isn't his first go round with these kind of legal issues. Court documents show that Stevie forged documents and impersonated the account holder of a credit card at a completely different church in Georgia. That claim resulted in a lawsuit in 2020. Now, according to WREG in Memphis, a former church member of that Georgia congregation brought the claims to the leaders and elders of the 901 church. They were demanding that Stevie be removed as the lead pastor and also that changes be made to the church's bylaws. Well, this former member told WREG that when those demands were made, they were ignored and that his church membership 
along with others' church memberships, were revoked. Now, this member also claimed that Stevie is more concerned about the intake of money than he is for the people's relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, I want to remind you, this is just one person speaking out to a media outlet. I just want to be clear about how the information is presented. And I'm going to tell you, I'm not really sure where this goes from here. Will he retain his role as a pastor? Will members leave and find another church? Will he be vindicated? I'll watch and let you know when I know But the harsh reality is the damage might already be done, whether it's true or false. Well, that's your Thursday episode of Rise in Crime. I've got the same request. Please give us a follow on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube, along with a like or a thumbs up. And Rise in Crime is also available ad-free on Apple subscriptions and Patreon. Join me again on Monday for more morning crime news. I'm Mama Jules, and keep safe out there.